Eagles and the Colts. Josh Pawnell, phillymag.com. Birds 24-7. And uh, it's all birds all the time over there for Josh. And I know he's got more on his plate now. His partner, Tim McManus, moves on to ESPN. So uh, up the food chain there, Josh. A lot more for you to handle. But uh, very capable as you get ready for this football season. And uh, we know tomorrow night was the... The third preseason game of last year made the Eagles a hot Super Bowl <laughs> pick. No matter what happens tomorrow night, that's not going to happen, right? They will not turn into a hot Super Bowl pick if they play well tomorrow night. No, I mean, I think they might be able to win 100 to nothing, and people still won't predict that they'll make the playoffs. I mean, the, the circumstances around this team is, is certainly quite different. Uh, but I also think people learned their lesson last year. You know, after a quarterback goes 10 for 10, looks amazing, those three touchdown pass, 121 yards, doesn't mean he should quite be in the Hall of Fame yet. Um, so <laughs> I, definitely, I definitely think expectations will be tempered uh, after tomorrow's night, tomorrow night's game, regardless of Which the result. Which is good, though, right? I mean, this is what I opened up the show with today, Josh, saying, look, they can go three and out, and I don't think I'll care. They can score three touchdowns. And I don't think I'll care. I think last year taught us it doesn't matter what they do tomorrow night. I know everybody wants to see the first team offense do something, but does it really matter? Yeah, and you know, it's funny because obviously you prefer them do well than not do well just because they're playing. But I think Brent Selleck said it best. Um, I want to say it was after the first preseason game um, at home when the Eagles hosted the Buccaneers. Brent Selleck just said, you know, the long run in the league the more I realize that preseason just doesn't really matter. And I was like, that perfectly sums up uh, how people should view this. Because really, uh, what I think the value in preseason is, I mean, obviously, um, you want to get your starters a little bit of a rhythm before the season, uh, gain some chemistry. But really, I think the value is just in seeing, okay, which guys at the bottom of the roster should make the team? Um, Let's, you know, throw different guys in different situations. Should Marcus Smith or Steven Means make it? as a a potential final defensive end? Um, Should Nolan Carroll or Ron Brooks be the starter at cornerback? Um, And so I think it's more about position battles and who will make the team versus, you know, this will be a good predictor for how the team will be this season. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, And, you know, the question I really asked is, you know, I don't care what the first offense does. I want someone, like you just said, I want one of these guys who are kind of eh, fringy to stand out, do something that makes the coaching staff say, we got to figure out a way to keep that, uh, this guy. Are there guys like that tomorrow night? Yeah, well, I mean, there are guys who I think people have been talking about. Uh, Steven Means, obviously, has been a popular name. Jalen Watkins, moving, moving from corner last year uh, to safety this year. Uh, he seems to have really made a step up in his game. But one guy I don't think people have talked much about, Kenyon Barner. I mean, he's played, he's probably been one of the best players that the Eagles have had this preseason so far in the first two games. I mean, obviously we know what he can do in special teams, but just the elusiveness he had, especially in Pittsburgh, um, he averaged, I want to say, maybe 6.8 yards per carry. It was a very high number, and it wasn't misleading at all because he played very well. Um, and you can go back when the Eagles opened up the second half, the first drive of the third quarter, they went down and it scored a touchdown. Kenyon Barner had at least three or four, I won't even call them broken tackles because he made the defenders miss in a way where they didn't even touch him. So, I mean, Kenyon Barner has really uh, looked better, at least than I expected, and I think many people uh, would expect of your third string or, or potentially your fourth string running back, depending on how that depth chart plays out. Give me your thoughts on the running back position because I find it to be – Very interesting with, when I look at Kansas City, I see Jamal Charles is really the guy there, meaning that 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 Andy Reid offense and what, you know, uh, Doug Peterson kind of knows is he wants a guy to be the guy. Um, Here, do they have, they might have Ryan Matthews talent-wise, but I don't know that you can count on him. So, do you see the Eagles running back situation maybe being different from what Andy uh, had in Kansas City? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely not going to be um, you know, a main workhorse where none of the other guys really touch the ball. It's definitely going to be a running back by committee, even though Ryan Matthews will obviously get a disproportionate amount of carries, as he should. Um, but I think they're also going to be cautious of, you know, let's not run him 25, 30 times a game because obviously we know how injury prone he is. You know, maybe 15 carries will be good for him um, in a game where, you know, you can fluctuate that depending on, on how things are going. But it'll definitely be, let's lean on Ryan Matthews, 
but we also need to get other running backs involved, whether it's Darren Sproles or Wendell Smallwood in the passing game even, um, or you know, third down back. So I definitely think that there's going to be some mixing in of running backs, even if Ryan Matthews is playing well for you. Yeah, you look at Sproles, uh, you know, uh, you know you can't count on him to, to carry the ball a whole heck of a lot, but um, you know that Whitehead in San Diego caught the football a lot. The, the Kansas City backs are pretty versatile, catching the football a lot. Uh, is he a guy that you anticipate seeing even more in the passing game this year? Uh, definitely more than last year. Uh, one thing that I think we've uh, touched on this a little bit, Mike, but one thing that really struck me when I was rewatching the Eagles Steelers game, um, the, the rewatch of the broadcast, I mean, I counted at least a dozen package plays. Now, what those are is when you you know you have a run play, and then you also build in the passing option for the quarterback. So maybe you're in shotgun, you do an inside or outside zone run play, but the quarterback built into the play has the option to pull the ball and throw a little bubble screen or maybe a quick slant to somebody. So I think Doug Peterson's a lot more creative than people give him credit for, and I'm really curious how that creativity will play out in the regular season, but also who it will play out with. I mean, you have Darren Sproles, who obviously he's you know, a good receiver out of the backfield, but maybe you want to put him in the slot. You know, Maybe you want to do uh, some more two-back sets where you have uh, Darren Sproles and Ryan Matthews or maybe even Sproles and Smallwood. I mean, I think that they're going to be, even though there isn't a ton of talent on offense, uh, I do think that there's going to be some ways for, for Doug Peterson to kind of use the versatility that some of his skill players have. And that's one thing I'm really curious to see how that plays out. And, you know, are we just seeing it now because it's the preseason, or are we going to see this as a big part of the game plan in the regular season? Josh Pawnell's with us, phillymag.com, birds 24-7. Josh, uh, there was a report earlier in the week that Howie Roseman uh, was still looking to make some moves. Uh, do you anticipate something else happening by the start of the season with a guy – uh, maybe not a back end of the roster guy. Do you think they're looking to add to uh, the starting, you know, rotation? Yeah, well, I mean, if if I would have had to give my best uh, educated guess, it would be. A, it would, I think it would be a guy maybe somewhat similar to Doriel Green Beckham, where um, you know he was drafted highly, or at least people had high expectations for him coming out of college, or at what point in his career, and for one reason or another, just didn't quite pan out, and try to take a risk on a guy like that who. His production maybe hasn't been very good, but the potential is there. I mean, Howie Roseman has talked about that several times uh, since they trade up for Carson Wentz. I mean, he was very open about how, you know, we trade these picks for Carson Wentz. So just numbers-wise, we have less picks. So we're going to be a lot more willing uh, to take a risk on guys. I mean, that's why you saw them take guys like uh, Jalen Mills and Alex McAllister and, and Wendell Smallwood and other people with with potential off-the-field concerns, and that even extended to the undrafted free agents, uh, a few of them they brought in. So I think you'll see one of those uh, maybe high-risk, high-reward uh, type moves in the next couple of weeks, or even um, just waiting for another team to make their cut down on, uh, on the final cut today and just, okay, this guy wasn't quite good enough to make the Seahawks' uh, final 53 or the Packers' final 53, but we think he could add something here. Um, so I definitely think that the, that Howie Roseman and the Eagles are looking to make moves because it doesn't seem like they're very happy with at least the entire structure of their roster right now. Uh, give me your impressions of Doriel Green Beckham. I don't know how much you guys get to watch him at practice, but obviously he's a physical specimen. Uh, does he seem to you like he's got to play, with knowing what you know about the other guys? Yeah, well, unfortunately, the his first practice, um, or even his first walkthrough, was a day after training camp, so... We haven't really gotten to see him at all um, during practice, at least outside of stretching it and warming up. But just from you know talking to people and watching some of his, his past film, really what you said was right, physical specimen. I mean, I think Frank Reich used the phrase impressive physical specimen. Jordan Matthews compared him to LeBron James. And he's really going to be the type of receiver that you want to target in the red zone. The guy where, I mean, you saw it last week against Pittsburgh. You just want to basically give him a jump ball in the end zone and tell him, you know what, we're just going to run a fade, go get it. You're, you know, you're 6'5", you're 230, uh, you can jump, you can run. Um, we're just going to try to throw it in your vicinity and, and hope that you can go make the catch for us. Um, and so the Eagles are going to add a few more concepts and route combinations to his plate this week. You're still obviously, he's only a week and a half in, so you're not going to see him running all the routes in the entire playbook 
Um, but even though they're adding some stuff to his plate, I still think you're going to see them try to go back to him in the red zone because I think that's really where they're going to try to maximize his value. Is he? If you looked at, if they were playing a real game tomorrow, is he? Is he out on the field, uh, first team playing on the outside with Jordan Matthews uh, and Nelson Aguilar? Um, I mean, if he if tomorrow was the first game and he you know knew the playbook and he just had a little bit more time under him, then then yeah, I mean, I think what's really holding him back right now isn't his talent or anything like that. I think what the only thing holding him back right now is. The Eagles just traded for him what last Tuesday, so he just doesn't. He's not that familiar with with the playbook yet, or he, he doesn't have many reps under him uh, with all these plays. So I think once he gets uh, comfortable with the playbook, I mean, Doug Peterson even said a couple of days ago, you know, it's not where you want him to be because we just got him. But once he gets to that point, I do think you'll see a lot of him. And I don't know if he'll be the first number three receiver out there, but I definitely think you're going to see him. I get some reps when the when the regular season games come around, uh, particularly again as I just mentioned in the red zone, um, because you know in, in that area he doesn't need to know the entire playbook. Um, you know maybe you just give him a few different routes and, and just say, hey, perfect these, and we're going to try to get you the ball. What's your take? I know Paul Turner seems to be a very uh, popular guy. He's caught the ball, which is more than you can say for others. But in your <laughs> opinion, does he have a realistic shot to to make this team? I absolutely think it's a realistic shot. I'm not sure how likely it is just because the way I view it, I mean, I, there are three guys that um, I feel pretty comfortable saying are going to be on the uh, final 53-man roster. Obviously, Jordan Matthews, Nelson Aguilar, and Doriel Green Beckham is a guy that I'd be surprised if he didn't make it. Um, so I think that they're only going to keep five receivers. I don't think they have enough talent to justify keeping six. Um, I know he's not popular among the fans, but Josh Huff, gives you something as your starting kick returner and on other special teams. I mean, that's how guys at the bottom of the roster are judged is what do they bring on special teams. Um, so I would list him as a guy that makes the team. Um, and then I think the final spot probably comes down to Ruben Randall, Chris Given, or Paul Turner. Um, and you really saw in the last game when you could kind of um, juxtapose the, the Josh Huff drop early in the game and the Paul Turner one-handed grab later in the game, like, just how the unfortunately just the simple act of catching a ball is not a common occurrence for this group of receivers, especially on a consistent basis. So you want to give Paul Turner an edge because of that, but he also feels like a guy they could just stash on the practice squad and just develop him. Maybe next year he makes it. Uh, but I do think it's realistic and it's not out of the question that he makes the team. Yeah, it just seems like, okay, let's say he makes the team now. Um, how many are you giving them? Five wideouts on this team? You, you, you counting five? Yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, it wouldn't shock me if they went six, but I mean, I, I just don't think they have enough talent at receiver to, to go more than five. Right. So he, he makes a team, and he's the fifth guy. How much? Of, how much of a role does he even really have? Not much, and and that's. I mean, again, that's going back to Josh Huff. I mean, that's why Huff would make the team. Is um, I mean, maybe Huff. Maybe Huff is the fifth receiver and Turner or one of the other guys is the fourth receiver, but the fifth receiver is really not going to play much. So that's why they have to give you something on specialty. Um, even if he can't catch the ball, even if he can't run routes, um, if he can give you something much more. Think about more that. A wide receiver team. might make the team that can't run routes and can't <laughs> catch the ball, but you've made it. Hey, hey I, I, I'm not the one that built the roster. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the unfortunate state. And I think it was really telling how the Eagles – obviously made the trade for Green Beckham, and then they put in a claim for Rasheed Bailey, whom they cut last year. I mean, keep in mind, the Eagles receivers, it's not like they were very good last year. So this is a guy that didn't even make the team, a wide receiver that didn't make the team last year, who they put a claim in to sign last week to bring him in and try to compete. So I think it's pretty clear that the Eagles aren't that happy uh, with the state of the receivers right now. How To you, do you look at this group as boom or bust, or do you just look at them as average no matter what? Like, you know, you got a first-rounder, what, three second-rounders, Huff's a third-rounder. I mean, you would think there's talent at the yin-yang with this group, but it's just not, you know, they just they haven't haven't displayed it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to make – I wish I could give Eagles fans a little bit more optimism, but I don't think there's very much boom potential in this position group. I mean, I think Nelson Aguilar, even though he hasn't been stellar in the preseason or training camp, um, I think he could be pretty good for you and take some significant steps forward. 
But outside of him, I mean, I don't know. You know Green Beckham, uh, maybe once he learns the playbook, I mean, he can give you something on a consistent basis. But that was the big knock on him in Tennessee. And really throughout his time, um, football has been the consistency. Will he bring it, uh, the effort, every single play? So even though they do have some talent, um, they aren't guys who have turned that into production. So they do have some potential. But, I mean, I think if this wide receiver group as a whole turns out to be average, that you absolutely take that if you're an Eagles fan. Most likely. And, uh, look, we saw a couple of years ago, uh, I hate to reference back to Kansas City, their wide receivers didn't catch a touchdown. Uh, you know, their tight ends were very good, yeah. but they didn't get a touchdown catch from a wide receiver. Um, and, uh, you know, they made the playoffs uh, last year. They were a pretty good football team with, uh, you know, they had Macklin, but not a great wide receiver group down there. Maybe this offense uh, doesn't, you know, Andy's team didn't have great wide receivers either when he was here. So maybe this offense just uh, isn't really wide receiver predicated. Yeah, and that's one thing I think has been hyped a bit, but I actually think deservedly so is the potential of multi and even three tight end sets. I mean, when you have three tight ends in, you know, Brent Stella, Zach Ertz, and Trey Burton, who can not only block but obviously give you something um, as a receiver, it really gives you some options of, you know, if they send three tight ends into the game, they can even play it where, okay, we're going to give Sam Bradford, as I mentioned before, maybe a, a run pass option or maybe – you know, they'll call a play, but they'll give them a check at the line of scrimmage. Okay, if they bring in, you know, an additional linebacker, when we bring in three tight ends, we'll throw the ball because all three of our guys have that ability. Or, or maybe if the defense stays in nickel because our wide receivers, or our tight ends can catch the ball, you can check it to a run play. So I think that's one element where, you know, it's not like they're going to be doing that every single play. But I do think that will give them some options and give Doug Peterson a little bit of flexibility as a play caller when you have those three tight ends. Um, who can give you something built in the run game and the pass game. So, you know, best case scenario, the Eagles, as you said, don't even really need too much production from their receivers. Uh, the tight end spot's interesting. You got the three guys, as you met in Burton, but uh, Burton being the third and then Chris Pantel being the fourth guy. Do you think they keep four tight ends? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, we actually just circled back around this with, with Doug on uh, the past couple of days. I mean, he still see the his, Doug Peterson's plan is still to keep a fourth tight end, um, mostly because uh, Pentella can give you something both a little bit as a fullback, but also going back to what we've talked about a few times now, just the special teams value. Um, you're not going to keep a fourth tight end if he gives you nothing on special teams. Uh, so Doug Peterson's plan is uh, to keep a fourth tight end and even have a fourth tight end active on game day. Um, so I do think wow. that you'll see uh, Pintelli make the final 53-man roster. Josh Ponell, uh, phillymag.com, birds 24-7. Um, say Amala's out, uh, Wisniewski in. How much does this hurt Say Amala, a guy who, by no fault of his own, missed the OTAs, was already behind, running the wrong way on plays in, in game one. He seemed better in game two, but to miss this game, how big of a step back uh, is that for him? Oh, yeah, I, mean, I definitely think it's a, a notable setback for him. I mean, the best way, you know, even the Eagles offensive line will acknowledge the best way for him to get adjusted, for him to get acclimated, you just throw him into the fire right now because, you know, your alternative, or at least how the Eagles view their alternative and stuff in Wisniewski isn't that much better. So just throw the rookie out there. Excuse me. Uh, just try to give him as many reps as possible. And, you know, he was, I mean, even Isaac Stigamala will tell you, he told us, he told the media this after the game. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't good at all in that first game, but he definitely took strides in that second game. And that's, I think, really why they went, instead of alternating with Newski and Stadium Miles, they were like, you know what, let's just give Stadium Miles every rep, try to maximize the development he could have in the preseason, and hopefully he gets better each and every game. But now this is definitely a setback in the plan. I mean, what Newski has a shot at maybe convincing the Eagles to give him the starting left guard job, um, once William Johnson is suspended, if that you know eventually comes down as, and is upheld, um, but it's definitely um, a setback for Sam Mahler and the Eagles, especially because not you don't just want Sam Mahler to develop, but you also want Jason Peters to his left and Jason Kelsey to his right to get accustomed to him. The communication, sure. the small things, you know, what angles do they want to take on combination blocks, working to the second level and getting to that Mike linebacker. So I mean, there are a lot of different small things that this affects outside of just stadium miles growth. Which could be fair to say, potentially, it's one of the reasons why Kelsey struggled so much last year because of the 
uh, you know, the lack of continuity with his guards. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's absolutely fair to say that the Eagles guard play had uh, uh, definitely had an impact on Kelsey last year. I mean, even Kelsey will tell you that even considering that he didn't play as well as he should have, but the not having the continuity, but also not just not having continuity, but not having stellar play at guard next to him uh, really hurt him. So obviously Brandon Brooks should help that. So even though he does have a rookie next to him, maybe the addition of Brandon Brooks and hopefully Jason Peters stays healthy, that, those can be kind of two mitigating factors I in mean, having a rookie next to Jason Kelsey. Um, but, I mean, each guy on the offensive line uh, affects the person next to them. So that, that's definitely another one of those uh, things that the Sayumalo injury, even if he only misses one game, has an effect on. Eagles line better this year or last year? And last year was horrible. Oh, well, I mean, that's a good <laughs> question because – I mean, I, I would have said, if you asked me this three weeks ago, I would have said better, but with Lane Johnson out for 10 games, um, if, you know, if Lane's out for 10 games, as expected, um, I don't know how much you can expect Peters to stay healthy. I think it's really going to depend on can Jason Peters stay healthy. Because if Jason Peters can stay healthy somehow through the entire season, then they could be better, um, especially with Brandon Brooks in there at right guard. But if Jason uh, Peters is in and out of the lineup, and you have, you know, Alan Barber at right tackle and Matt Tobin at left tackle. I'm not sure how much better that offensive line is. With you know, with a rookie at left guard, terrible. How much better that line is than last year? So, I mean, that Lane Johnson suspension, um, if it is upheld and if he has to serve that, is really going to be a big blow uh, to the Eagles. Uh, there's so much more we can get into before this third game. It's uh, Josh Pawnell <laughs> for more. Check out phillymag.com. He's got. Uh, players to watch that he's going to be looking for uh, for the game on Saturday night. Guys that have uh, stood out so far. A lot of great content at uh, phillymag.com. Birds 24-7. Josh Pawnell here on the Bash. Enjoy the game, pal. Thanks for having me, Mike. Have a good weekend.